We're going to read John 9 together. 9, 1 to 7. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, it was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with mud and said to him, Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Lord, open our eyes. Good morning. A couple of weeks ago, we began to look at this passage in John where Jesus executes one of the most significant miracles recorded in this gospel, the healing of a man born without sight. And to the first audience, we have to understand this was a miracle without precedence. This is something that only God himself could perform such a, such a miraculous work. And so for John's audience, this was more than a miracle. It was a sign. John is telling his readers, not only is Jesus the long-awaited Savior, the Messiah, he is God. And so uh, a couple weeks ago, we looked especially at the first three verses of this chapter regarding the way in which God chose to work in and through this man's suffering. In fact, our, our song selections this morning really highlighted this idea that everything that God is doing is wonderful, that God is always being good. He is always being kind. He is actually, in fact, always reducing suffering even when he allows it and causes it. And so this man was blind from birth so that God would be glorified in this. Today, we are going to zoom into the next four verses. In order to set up the rest of the chapter, uh, which God willing, will preach next week. So we're going to just take another four verses, and this will set up the rest of the story where uh, the people will not even believe that this man has been healed. And so we'll, let's read again. John 9, and let's just read verses 4 to 7. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So he went and washed, and came back seeing. Jesus has just declared that he is the light of the world. And now he proceeds to illustrate the point by giving light to a man born blind. And the way that Jesus goes about healing this man serves to further emphasize the main point of John's preaching, that Jesus is God. And so there, there's a couple elements here. We've got the, the spit and the mud and the pool, and this is not going to be a three-point sermon on the spit, the mud, and the pool, but I just said it that way. Jesus uh, spits into the mud, and he's going to apply this to the man's eyes. Now, someone else's saliva today is generally considered a dirty thing, unless you really like them, um, but <laughs> without the modern invention of the microscope and understanding germs and microbial contagion, the ancient audience considered saliva among just about every other bodily fluid uh, to convey uncleanness. Somehow the uncleanness of one became the uncleanness of another when we passed on these bodily fluids. But if the bodily fluids of an unclean human transfer their filth, so by the same ancient logic could the reverse apply from one who is wholly pure. And so Jesus makes this amazing power claim here that what would pass on impurity from an unrighteous man, from him would instead convey wholeness to the blind man. 
And so Jesus said, this, if it was anybody else, me spitting in your eye would be disgusting. It would transfer filth, uncleanness. But by Jesus' bodily fluid, because he is holy, perfect, and righteous, that it would convey something different. And so the same statement is made by the healing of the leper in Matthew chapter 8, verses 2 to 3. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleaned, cleansed. Sorry. In those days, and according to the Mosaic law, to touch a leper was to contract ritual uncleanness, if not the leprosy itself. But for Jesus... Rather than to contract the leper's uncleanness, he heals the leper of his disease. There's something else going on here. The the natural order of things, filth to filth, uncleanness to uncleanness, disease to disease has been reversed in the power of Christ. When he touches the leper, rather than to contract the leper's disease or uncleanness, he passes on the wholeness that is within him. And so Jesus does not just apply his saliva as a salve to this man's sightless eyes, but first he stoops to the ground, and he forms mud from his spittle and the dust of the ground. The allusion to Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 is, is actually hard to miss here. Since God made human beings out of the dust of the ground, Jesus used a little dust to make eyes that were otherwise lacking. This is a creation miracle. The way that Jesus goes about this, he doesn't just speak to it and it's done like he does in several other healings, but this is a creation miracle. This man did not have what it took to see. He didn't just have an infirmity. He was lacking something from birth. And so what an epic reenactment of creation. God forming from the dust of the ground, just as in the very beginning when he moved beyond simply speaking creation into existence. He spoke everything else into existence, but with mankind, he stooped. He came down to personally form man from dust and breathe into him the breath of life. Of Christ, Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 to 17 of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Paul is saying some things here that can only be said about God. All things were created by him and for him. All things hold together. Their existence relies upon him. Jesus was the creator. So when Jesus does this, when he stoops and makes mud to apply to this man's eyes, he doesn't just imitate the Father's creative power, but he shows that that was his power from the beginning. And so John is flushing out the theme of Christ's divine creative power, which he had already introduced us to in John chapter 1, verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. There's such a powerful imagery here of Jesus creating just the way that he created all things. And what was lacking in this man for the glory of God, Jesus now glorifies the Father and is so glorified in his obedience, stooping and making something from nothing, his spittle, this dust, and now this man is made whole. The second main point of this passage is indicated by John's drawing attention to the meaning of Siloam. This is the pool which Jesus then sends the man to wash himself. The pool is called Sent. And John is going to let his Greek audience and us today know that this pool, its name is uh, important here. Now, Jesus is the supremely sent one. 
It's amazing, but 38 times in John, Jesus speaks of being the one who is sent by the Father. Already, I think, 14 times we've seen this coming up to this point in John. Every time he continues to talk about this, that he is the one sent to the Father. He glorifies only the one who sent him. He teaches only what was given to him by the Father who sent him. He doesn't do his own will, only the will of the one who sent him. At every turn, Jesus keeps on explaining that I've been sent. I've been sent. I'm on this mission because I've been sent. Having been sent by the Father, Jesus is now sending the one who has been miraculously granted sight. And this serves as the theme of the entire remainder of the chapter, but with the addition later of serving as a contrast with the Pharisees who are blind but refuse to seek a healer because they think that they can see. And so after healing this man, he sends him to sent. Do you see? And throughout the rest of the chapter, we're going to see that this man begins to be a witness to what Christ has done. And so in verse 4, it initiates the healing with a charge to Jesus' followers. He says, we must work the works of him who sent me. Jesus is the sent one, but they, plural, we, have to do the works that the Father has sent Jesus to do. Because Jesus is the only one capable of accomplishing this, but he includes his disciples in his work. Jesus is still the sent one from the Father, but he will send all of his disciples, them then and us now, with this commission. Christ's disciples are charged to work with him. Jesus has been sent and is sending this man with freshly opened eyes. Jesus then here exits the narrative for the longest period in John until after his death in John chapter 20. The next 26 verses or so follow this blind man, now healed. This is the longest time Jesus comes out of the story. Now it's a story about a man who's been sent with eyes open wide, who had never seen light but had been born in darkness and now sees the light of God. He's healed. Now he bears witness about what Christ has done to his neighbors, his family, and the religious leaders. And then towards the end, he will be rejected, insulted, reviled, and ultimately he will be cast out, excommunicated from the Jewish synagogue for his faithful witness, for sharing the message of what Christ had done in his life. And so John will utilize this event as a historical allegory. That's not to say that it's not a factual miracle accomplished before a myriad of witnesses, which it was, but this story has two meanings. One, the the factual, physical event, but then it's employed by John as inspired by the Holy Spirit to teach his original audience and us this morning regarding the spiritual sight Jesus provides as light of the world. And this theme was introduced in the first chapter of John, partially in the the chain reaction of faithful witnesses. John the Baptist witnesses to who Jesus is, to his disciple Andrew. Andrew then goes and gets his brother Peter. Peter finds Philip. Philip finds Nathaniel, each coming to Christ and immediately looking to share the good news of finding the promised Messiah. Jesus is the faithful witness so also are his disciples to be witnesses of what he has done. And so when Jesus opens this man's eyes, he is then immediately sent out, as all of Christ's disciples were and are today. Christ's atoning work on our behalf saves us from the punishment for our sins, saves us now from slavery to sin, But we also need to remember this morning what we have been saved for. 1 Peter 2, verse 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people... But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. 
Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Like this man born blind, all true believers have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light in order to proclaim God's glory to each other and to those who still walk in darkness. One of the the key symptoms that follows true spiritual sight is an impulse and a mandate to share this light. This is what we are gathered here for this morning. Maybe you don't realize this. Maybe you've come to a church because that's what we do, or maybe you've come to church to have that experience or that closeness or that teaching, but the purpose of our gathering this morning is that we can partner together in proclaiming this gospel. We are not a church that is interested in having as many possible people come here for their own needs to be met and to feel comfortable with the song selections and the sermon choice. We are here to equip one another to share the gospel because that is the commission of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. We are not here to find comfort. We are not here primarily to find community We are made into a community by our joint endeavor to share the good news of the gospel. Because when Christ opens our blind eyes and we find him beautiful, we cannot help but to be motivated and see the command that Christ has given us to share the good news of the gospel. This is our purpose. Peter puts this mission into two commands. This is the command of the church. We were once not a people. How are we made a people? How are we made into Christ's community? By taking up this mission to proclaim the excellencies of of him who called us out of darkness into his light. We are commanded to proclaim, preach the gospel is how Paul puts it in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The second mission is we're given here is to adorn the gospel with honorable conduct so that when we preach and are then insulted and reviled because of it, the haters would see our good deeds and know the truth of the gospel we proclaim. We have a double mission. Jesus' parable puts it like this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do you see how the dual aspects of this commission we've been given are laid out here twice? First, we are called to proclaim, preach the gospel, be the light that Jesus was. He says, I will be the light for as long as I'm here. And the implication there is not that then there will be no more light in the world, but the implication then is that Jesus is leaving a light. The Holy Spirit is still at work, a light in this world through believers who have had their eyes open to see having received every heavenly blessing in Christ Jesus, our call and command is only to serve those who will be our future brothers and sisters in the family of faith by calling them to repentance and displaying what that repentance looks like in our own lives. If we call people to repentance and then show no evidence of repentance ourselves, we look like liars, But if we show that the work of Christ is sufficient in our lives and we exhibit freedom from slavery to sin and not just perfection because we can't achieve that, but we can keep on showing our own repentance, the work that God is doing in our lives and the work of sanctification. Continue. I just want to read verses 4 and 5 again, if you can put it up on the screen. 
Jesus says, we must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. We have become very comfortable, church, with delayed obedience. We have this thought that we will someday obey on what God is commanding us to do today. And we think that we have this long extended time to accomplish the one thing that God is telling us to do today. But what we fail to understand is that God has commands for us today and tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And when we delay today's obedience for next week and next year, we are not delaying obedience, we are disobeying. A good example of this is when God commands Israel to go into the promised land and take it by force. And they say, no, it's too scary, not yet. And then God says, you have been disobedient. And he punishes them severely. And at that time, then they say, okay, no, no, we changed our mind. Now we're going to go in. And God says, no. Now my command to you is go and walk around in the wilderness for 40 years. (laughs) You, you have a different command at a different time. God's doing what he's, uh, go, he, God's going to accomplish what he's doing and he will give the correct command for the correct time. So when we delay obedience, we're just disobeying and calling it something a little nicer. Not only is, is to delay our, our obedience, disobedience, but the time is limited. Night is coming. The time is short for gospel proclamation and good deeds. The harvest is plentiful, Luke 10, 02. But the laborers are few. We have a, a call to produce fruit, the fruit of obedience, the fruit of an enlightened life, having our eyes open to the goodness of Christ. And when we see that fruit, it is evidence for us that we have lived in obedience and have indeed had our eyes open. But if we see no fruit and we will not boldly proclaim and we will continue to pretend that we're being obedient but delay it and wait and say, someday I'm going to do what God has called me to do, we need to really question whether we have had our eyes opened at all. You will be amazed at what God will accomplish in you and through you, as you are motivated and directed in obedience. God has called you to sacrificial extremes. God has called you to bold proclamation in the face of severe persecution. God has called you to even rely on him in in such a powerful way that you are no longer resting in your job or in your business or in your parents like I sometimes am for your provision, but that only God could possibly provide what we need in the situation he's put us into. But we delay obedience. You know, I know that we're supposed to preach the good news to everyone, but that's going to start when I finally get things figured out or when I finally know everything that there is to know, when I finally work up the courage. We are commanded to be faithful witnesses. Part of the the reason, I I don't want to tell you this story so that you look at me as as the uh, exemplar, the person to follow, but, but I can say, follow me as I follow Christ. And don't follow me the rest of the time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, part of the reason that I have this pulpit ministry and have this privilege is I, very early in, in my Christian walk, I said, I will not turn down an opportunity to preach the gospel. And so every time there was an opportunity, I took it. Even though I was bad at it, even though I was just learning, even though I didn't know everything that there was to know, I determined to be equipped and to take the opportunity. Now, I, I've learned even more recently that I still walked in total disobedience, and really that was just any time I was giving a public pulpit ministry, and that God has actually called me to preach the gospel at every opportunity when it's one person or two people and not when I'm given a pulpit. And so I'm not saying that I've been the one who's been perfectly obedient, but what I'm trying to tell you is that there is more that God has called us to if we will begin to walk in the obedience of today. 
Has God called us to preach the gospel at every opportunity in season and out of season? Absolutely. And this is what is being shown here as Jesus opens eyes and then sends. Is we too, if our eyes have been opened, are sent to be now the light to others. We are commanded to be faithful witnesses. But we are wholly unable to be faithful in our witness. There are are so many ways that the pressure, when the pressure comes down, whether it's fear or care of what others think or love of our own comfort, we are set aside and follow our own path rather than the path God has commanded us to. And we will continue to be wholly unable to obey Christ's most basic command until we have received sight from the one who himself is fully faithful. Jesus lived the righteous life that we could not live. He died the death that we deserve. He took on the suffering we could not endure so that we might receive the reward that we could never earn. Christ is the faithful witness. Throughout the rest of John, we will see Jesus continue to say exactly what the Father gives him to say. He will continue to be the light that not only reveals himself, but reveals the Father and the wickedness of the world around him. He will continue to point out their sin at inconvenient and public times. He will continue to love in a very bold manner and not withdraw into Canadian politeness, but will boldly love them by sharing with them and rebuking them. Jesus will then be hated even more than he already is at this point in the gospel. They will keep trying to kill him, and eventually he will give himself over to their schemes. And he would take on death for our sakes. Jesus gave himself up to be faithful in his witness. And he calls us who call ourselves by his name to take up our cross too and follow him. This is the work of Christ through his spirit. My prayer this morning is By his word, he will motivate us and equip us for this work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, that despite our inability to succeed in obedience, Christ's obedience is on our behalf. But Lord, I have so much thanksgiving in my heart this morning that you did not just obey instead of us, but you obeyed in a way that would enable us to obey. Because you have granted us every heavenly blessing, that your reward is ours through your work alone, that we are reaping not what we sow, but what you have sown, God, we can lay aside every other endeavor. We do not need to seek for reputation. We do not need to seek for financial security. We do not need to seek for our comforts in this life because these things are passing away so quickly. Night is coming and the day is short for gospel proclamation. Father, I ask that you would do a work in us by your spirit this morning that you would enable us, equip us Make us bold to share the good news. Lord, if we are only pretending to be those who see and therefore are not sharing the light of your gospel, I pray that you would show us that even now. Reveal to us where we have walked in blindness and called it light. Turn us in our hearts towards you. This is all the work of Christ. Pray this now for his glory. Amen.